It was a cool evening in the spring of 2009. Percy and Thomas were soon due to leave on their mail run, but right now the engines were resting after what had been a very busy day. I'm afraid to say Thomas was feeling rather annoyed. I don't understand what this Wi-Fi thing is and why Annie and Carol have to have it fitted. He'd had to leave them at the works that morning and had missed them for the rest of the day. I think it's got something to do with the internet, Thomas. At least that's what driver said when Henrietta and Victoria had it fitted last week. They had it done last week. Oh yes, we've not had our passengers complaining about not getting a signal since then. It seems to make them happy. Thomas and Percy frowned, both confused. What do they mean, not getting a signal? We have them all along the line. I know. I don't know what they're on about. I mean, if we didn't have signals, we'd have all sorts of accidents. Thomas said, as Sir Stephen Topham Hatt joined them. It's not that sort of signal, Thomas. They mean a 3G signal, a sort of two-way radio link that lets your passengers get the internet on their phones and laptops. Thomas frowned. Then what's Wi-Fi? A more reliable way of providing them that internet connection. It was Emily's idea to provide this extra service to our passengers. After all, we do want them to be satisfied. I see, sir. Thomas knew the fat controller was talking about Emily Helen Hatt, the railway's director of customer and public relations. She was also Sir Topham's daughter. Excuse me, sir, but did you just come here to talk about this? It was quite unusual for the fat controller to visit the sheds this late. Sir Topham shook his head. I'm visiting all the sheds tonight. There's something I need to tell each of you. Thomas, Percy and Toby, it has been a pleasure working with you over the last few decades. However, I'm afraid the time has come for me to leave the railway. You mean you're retiring, sir? Percy asked, hoping he'd misheard. I'm afraid so, Percy. It's not quite my decision. My doctor has made it quite clear that I can no longer run this railway full-time. But sir, if you're gone, who will run the railway? I've still got to decide that, Toby. There's a meeting of the railway's board of directors on Friday, and I'll be nominating someone then. Until that's been done, Norman Spencer will be acting controller. The three engines exchanged a concerned look. They had only met Norman Spencer, the railway's deputy director, a handful of times but they'd got the impression that he wasn't exactly a fan of steam engines. Don't worry, I won't be leaving without making sure you're all in good hands. Well, sir, it was was a pleasure working with you too. Oh, yes. Definitely. The fat controller smiled for a moment. Thank you. But as the fat controller strode away, there was a lot weighing on his mind. After all, there was a reason he'd given himself a week to choose his successor. The morning after the Fat Controller's announcement, Gordon was backing down onto the express. He was a bit worried. All the engines were. Sir Topham's sudden resignation had come as a bit of a shock. Penny for your thoughts, Gordon. You look bothered. Did the Fat Controller visit you in your sheds last night? Yes. He told us he was resigning. Is that what's worrying you? In a way, little Oliver. I don't know if you've met Norman Spencer, but he's what my driver calls a bean counter. A bean counter? Yes. It means he only really cares about money. I've heard him say we steam engines are too expensive. What? That's ridiculous. I mean, the amount of rail fans who come to visit us. We wouldn't sell all those tickets with diesels alone. I know, but... Gordon broke off as an unfamiliar diesel horn sounded out. Both steam engines looked over to see a sleek, modern diesel approaching the station. He stopped just at the end of the platform, and his driver climbed down to report their arrival. The Diesel, whose name was Shane, looked from Gordon to Oliver. Hmm, I've heard the engines here are a bit out of date, but 
Blimey. No wonder your controller called me in. Excuse me? I mean, how does your railway keep running with such an outdated means of propulsion? Perfectly well, thank you. I doubt it. Why else would your controller arrange for me to be here? I doubt Sir Topham would have arranged such a thing. We've no need for another mainline engine, do we, Gordon? No, not since Peter was restored in 1996. Gordon replied, thinking of the most recent addition to the railway's fleet. Shane shot a look at Oliver. Hold on, so who? Sir Stephen Topham Hutt, our controller. Hmm, former controller. Oliver said, Sir Topham's unexpected retirement still hadn't quite sunk in. Or was it Norman Spencer who called you in? Yes, that's it. You don't know who your controller is? He's not our controller. He's only acting until Sir Topham nominates a successor on Friday. Nonetheless, Gordon, I am in charge until then. Gordon looked over to see Norman Spencer standing next to him on the platform. Shane will be running trains here for the next few days. Do you mean as a trial? To see what's needed to modernize this railway, yes. Spencer's phone rang a moment later, and he strode away to answer it. I'm sure you're acting controller will find my performance more than adequate. Gordon frowned angrily. He'd heard that sort of talk before. You are, are you? Would you like to put your motors where your mouth is? What do you mean? The express is regularly timed between here and Crowley's Gate. So what if it is? I'm due to leave in a few minutes. If your performance is more than adequate, then you should be able to match the time I set for this run. Are you challenging me to a time trial? If you want to put it that way. Hmm. Very well. Shane replied as his driver climbed back into his cab. With the growl of his engine, he moved off. Gordon's guard blew his whistle a few moments later, and the express engine quickly departed. Gordon rapidly accelerated determined to get a good start. He'd laid down the challenge, and he meant to win it. Getting his train up to speed quickly would be the key. Come on! Come on! He chuffed to the coaches. He continued picking up speed, and was soon racing along the line. Take it easy, Gordon, his driver said. You're at the speed limit. That was the last thing Gordon wanted to hear. He wanted to go faster, to lay down a time that that odious diesel couldn't beat at all but he knew that the limit was in place for a reason. His driver adjusted his regulator and Gordon reluctantly backed off, just maintaining a steady but rapid pace. As he approached a corner, Gordon saw a lorry stalled on the crossing up ahead. He blasted his whistle. Get out of the way! To Gordon's horror, the lorry driver jumped down and ran clear. Driver! Brakes! Gordon's driver threw on the brakes. The engine braked as hard as he could, but it was too late. A few minutes later, Henry was approaching East Knapford when he saw the station master waving a red flag. He quickly came to a stop. What's happened? Gordon's had an accident with a lorry. You ought to go and help. Leave your train here. A worried look crossed Henry's face. Is Gordon all right? I don't know. From what I heard, it was a bad accident. You'd better get moving. Bear's bringing the breakdown train up from the yard. Henry was quickly uncoupled. Then he chuffed off to help Gordon. As Henry approached the crash site, the full extent of the accident became apparent. Gordon's buffers were buried in the twisted, torn remains of the lorry, and ballast was scattered everywhere. Gordon! Gordon! You alright? There was no reply from the blue engine. Gordon? The guard from the express strode up to the green engine. Henry, you'll need to clear the coaches that are still on the tracks. 
course. Bear came alongside as Henry carefully approached the coaches. The diesel gently came to a halt and a group of workmen climbed down from the works unit coach. As they began to assess the situation, a young woman in a business suit joined them. Emily Helen Hatt knew that she needed to be on the scene and had ridden with them from Knapford. After all, an accident this big required personal attention from the Director of Customer and Public Relations. Was anyone injured? Gordon's in a bad way. I saw Harold leaving, I think he's had to medevac a few people. Bear winced. What about the other passengers? I've overheard the guards say they've been taken to East Knapford. I better get these out of the way. Henry moved back slowly, wary of the damaged track. As he did so, a sleek red BMW pulled up near the level crossing. Norman Spencer climbed out, and he quickly joined Emily and the guard. What happened? The guard quickly explained, Spencer's expression darkening as he did so. It sounds quite careless, Gordon running flat out like that. Mr. Spencer, Gordon's crew have confirmed the express was running at the speed limit for this section of the line. Witnesses have told me that the line stalled on the crossing. Now that's hardly Gordon's fault. Well, we should probably wait and see what the safety director of investigation says. Can you line up a press conference for this evening? Emily nodded. Shall we say 16.30? That should be just in time to catch the evening news. That would be perfect. Emily nodded again and turned to go. She'd seen all she needed here. Now she had to look after the express's passengers. Henry, wait! The green engine stopped, slightly surprised. Could you give me a lift to East Knapford? I've got to look after the passengers. Of course, Miss Hatt. Emily climbed into Henry's cab, and he departed. He was still a bit upset about what Norman Spencer had said. Gordon would never be so careless, especially not with passengers, and he certainly wouldn't be speeding. You know that as well as I do, Miss Hatt. I know, but Mr. Spencer hasn't had as much experience with your engines as I have. He's been mainly managing the corporate side of the railway. Yes. If I may say so, Miss Hatt, we're all a bit worried about that. That diesel he's brought in, he's not really needed. Henry said, worried. He'd overheard an exchange between Shane and Percy earlier, while picking up some trucks in the main yard. He's only visiting you, me. I'm sure Mr. Spencer doesn't mean to replace his steam engines. Besides, he's only acting until Dad decides who he'll recommend to the railway's board. I hope you're right, Miss Hatt. A while later, the accident had been cleared up, and Bear had brought Gordon to the steamworks at Provence Gate. Previously the works division of the North West Railway, the steamworks had been split off into a separate company a few years ago. Bear gently shunted the express engine into one of the steamworks sidings. Get well soon, Gordon. Bear glanced over as Jeff, the steamworks diesel, came up alongside. What happened to Gordon? Bear quickly explained about the lorry driver who'd got stuck on the crossing. What a fool! I know. Fortunately, no one was killed. I'll leave Gordon in your buffers. I'm afraid he'll have to stay here for the moment. I've got no orders to move him to the works. Bear frowned, slightly puzzled. Well, Mr. Spencer has only just started acting as our controller. He may have to get up to speed. I expect he'll get in contact with your manager shortly. With that, Bear departed sadly. The news of Gordon's accident soon spread across the railway, and the engines couldn't help feeling a bit worried. Those on the main line were especially concerned. After all, with Gordon gone, Shane's presence was needed. Later that evening, Bear was bringing the express down from Barrow. With Gordon out of action, the other mainline engines were looking after it, on top of their regular trains. Bear braked to a smooth stop at Gordon's gate and glanced over at the works. Gordon's repairs should be well underway by now, he thought. But to his surprise, Gordon was still sitting outside the works, where Bear had left him earlier. That's odd. What's odd, Bear? Bear glanced over at Hobo Hugh. Uh, oh, Gordon's still sitting outside the steamworks. I thought they'd have started referring him by now. Does that worry you? Yes, I mean, he's our main express engine. 
I thought these repairs would be given high priority. Maybe they're just busy. I don't think so, Bear. Jeff mentioned they may have Douglas in there today. Something about a five yearly service. Bear's frown deepened, and he remembered what Jeff had told him earlier about not having orders to repair Gordon. As he pulled out of the station, a nasty suspicion crossed his mind. He knew that the steamworks were more than capable of handling three or four engines at once. So, Bear thought, there must have been another reason why Gordon had been left waiting outside. But, try as he might, Bear couldn't think of a good one. He was pondering this all the way to Nutford Station. Are you alright, Bear? Bear looked over to see Emily Hatt standing on the platform. She'd had to work late, thanks to Gordon's accident. Well, I'm a bit worried, Miss Hatt. Bear quickly recanted what he'd seen at the works, and what he'd heard from Jeff and Ivo Hugh. Emily nodded thoughtfully when he'd finished. That is odd, Bear. I'll make some inquiries. Thank you. Emily set a reminder on her smartphone to look into Gordon's repairs tomorrow morning. A moment later, Bear's driver uncoupled him, and the Heimek diesel headed for the sheds. Bear backed down into the sheds, noticing a somber silence instead of the usual chatter. So, you've heard then? You mean about Gordon? Yes. Was it a dangerous section of the line? It's that crossing up to East Knapford Station. It's just beyond the curve, so there's little distance to stop once you can actually see it. Henry explained. He'd had a near miss there himself a few years ago. I see. I'll have to be careful on my timed run tomorrow then. The other engine stared at him, confused. What's timed run? Shane explained about Gordon's challenge. By the time he'd finished, most of the other engines were frowning. Is that all you can think about at a time like this? Gordon wouldn't even have had that accident if you weren't here. Nonsense! Shane glanced over at Henry. You just said it was a dangerous corner. Henry didn't reply immediately. He knew that most engines usually took that corner slower than the speed limit. Well, if he hadn't felt threatened, he wouldn't have tried to take that corner at the speed limit. Shane was taken aback. Me? A threat? I'm only here to compare... Compare your performance with ours? Yes. Don't be so naive. If you're found to be more efficient, what do you suppose will happen to us? Hmm? Do you know what happened to my brothers on the other railway? They were replaced by more powerful diesels like you. Shane paused and looked over at the other engines. From Diesel, the smallest, to the largest, a Stania ATF named Peter, all of them were engine classes that had been withdrawn years ago. He'd rarely seen engines like them, and only then on rail fan excursions. Hmm, proficiency is the key to a railway survival, although I can see why you vintage engines can't understand that. I must admit, I can't see how your railway is still running. The other engines were outraged. Even Alice looked furious. How dare you! Disgraceful! Despicable! You got some nerve. Alice whistled loudly, her shrill blast drowning out the angry bell. When she'd finished, silence fell over the sheds. Mother suggests that you try looking at facts instead of judging something you know nothing about. Hmm. I know perfectly well how to handle trains. I think Alice means you know nothing about our railway. That's it exactly, Peter. The other engines murmured in agreement. If I may say something, Diesel said, looking closely at Shane. I used to think like you, but I soon realised the fact is that this fully operational railway was, and still is, running successfully with vintage engines. I realised I was missing something. Age doesn't come into it. We'll have to wait and see, then. An uncomfortable silence fell over the shed. But as the other engines drifted off to sleep, Shane couldn't help thinking about what Diesel had said. Like it or not, he couldn't deny that the Class 8 had made a good point. 
The next morning, Thomas and Duck were waiting to depart Knapford Station with their trains. Thomas looked over apprehensively as Norman Spencer strode up to him. Thomas, I've got a new assignment for you. And what would that be? I'd like you to take Diesel's place in the yard for a few days. He'll take your trains instead. Thomas was shocked. He'd only just got Hanny and Clarabelle back from the works, and now he was going to lose them again. But before he could say any more, Emily Hatt strode up to Spencer. Mr. Spencer, could I have a word? What about? Emily held up her phone, with an email from the railway's financial director on the screen. I've just received an email from Arthur Thompson. He says you haven't authorised payment to the steamworks for Gordon's repairs. Spencer nearly sighed. He'd had a feeling this would come up, sooner or later. I won't be authorising Gordon's repairs, Miss Hatt. In fact, I've contacted the National Railway Museum. As an LNERAO engine, I'm sure they'll be interested in him. Emily's eyes narrowed. I knew you had another reason for bringing that diesel in. Just a trial, you said. To determine what was needed for modernization, yes. He'll be going back on Friday, but his work here should give me all the information I need to bring this railway into the 21st century. We have to be seen to be modern, especially in today's slow economy. Anyway, diesels are much more efficient. You mean they're cheaper? Emily shook her head in disgust. It's only the bottom line that matters to you, isn't it? This isn't the first time this has happened, Miss Hat. Your great-grandfather sold some Victoria-era engines for scrap during the Great Depression, I believe. We're in the middle of a similar financial crisis now. If the railways to survive, sacrifices need to be made, as they were back then. That was a mistake made against Sir Toppen Hatt's wishes. Her great-grandfather's journal had made it quite clear that the directors of the time had forced his hand. Emily's right, Mr. Spencer. Thomas interjected, surprising both Emily and Spencer. The fat director said it was short-sighted at the time, and events proved him right. That will do, Thomas. Do you have any idea of what you're going to be throwing away? The experience of these engines. I don't see how. These engines have been running the railway for decades, Norman. Nearly a century for some of them. Do you really think throwing all that away is going to make the railway better? The savings in running costs will help ensure this railway survives. Emily frowned skeptically. What do you think attracts the tourists and rail fans here, Mr. Spencer? Every summer, the holiday packages we offer are fully booked. How is throwing away the main draw card for tourists going to guarantee that survival? Anyway, you don't even know if my father will nominate you to be the next controller yet. Who else would he nominate? None of the other directors have the experience I've got. I wouldn't count my chickens if I were you, Mr. Spencer. If it was that straightforward, Dad wouldn't be taking a week to make the decision. Spencer sighed. He'd had enough of this debate. <sighs> Miss Hatt, you're quite welcome to bring up these points at the board meeting on Friday. Until then, I'd like you to start working on an advertising campaign pushing the new, modern Northwest Railway. A determined glint came into Emily's eye. You'd be better off giving that to Adam Tyler. I'm sure he'll do well with my replacement. He's a bright lad. Your replacement? My family has looked after these engines and the railway since 1914. I cannot be a part of this. You have my resignation effective as of Monday. As for the rest of this week, I'll be doing whatever damage control is needed from Gordon's accident. Very well. You may be in charge of the railway, Mr. Spencer, but you will never be the fat control. Emily said, referring to the affectionate nickname used by the engines for her father and his predecessors. Spencer didn't reply. He just turned and strode off to his office. Miss Hatt? Yes, Tommy? If he modernizes the railway, what's going to happen to us? I mean, we'll be... scrapped. Thomas, did you know that the United Kingdom has the largest proportion of railway museums and heritage railways to population in the world? Huh? Oh, no, no. Thomas replied, slightly confused by the sudden change in topic. It means I shouldn't have a problem finding places for all of you, and I'll have enough time to start looking for Monday, if it comes to that. What do you mean, if it comes to that, ma'am? As I said, I don't think Dad would take a week to decide his successor if it was an easy decision. Emily sighed. I suppose I'll have to start making arrangements. But don't worry, I'll make sure you're all looked after. With that, she turned and strode into the station. The two steam engines exchanged a worried look. I think Sir Top and Hatt should be told about this. As far as Thomas could recall, the Hats who'd run the railway had made sure to look after the engines. He'd even heard Sir Charles Topham Hart refer to them as a sort of extended family. 
His retirement cottage is up near Kelston Road, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I've got a passenger run up to Barrow, after this one. I'll leave a message for him with the station master there. Please do. The guard's whistle rang out a moment later, and Dr. departed. Thomas watched him go, hopeful and worried. A few hours later, Shane was taking the express along the main line. Despite not being built for speed, he was making good time along the line. He was still planning to get the time for this run, not for the time trial, but just out of curiosity. After all, he'd never had a chance to compare his performance with that of a steam engine before. But as he approached Wellsworth, Shane found himself facing a red signal. He braked to a halt, annoyed, next to Donald. What's going on? The express isn't due to stop at this station. Donald glanced over. I'm not quite sure. The station master's talking to nothing now. The Scottish engine looked closely at Shane. You wouldn't have been that snobbish these life and him so much about, would you? Snobbish? Me? Aye, same with to alter on the railway. Shane frowned angrily, but before he could say any more, the station master joined the two engines. Looks like the computer virus has affected the signal systems. Do you mean all of the signals? I'm afraid so, Boko. Hmm, this is just what I need. Do you think I'm happy about this? You're not the only one who's stuck, you know. Sure enough, all the railway signals had automatically failed safe each one showing a dangerous condition. Across all the branches and main lines, the trains drew to a halt. Some were stuck at stations, but most were stranded out on the tracks. At Napford Station, Edward and James were waiting to depart with their trains. Both engines glanced over as the station master strode out onto the platform. He quickly explained about the problems with the signals. So what do we do with our trains? I've spoken to Mr Spencer. He's on his way back here now but all trains are to be held until the signals are fixed. But that could be ours! We can't leave these passengers stranded. They can get off here, James. It's the ones on trains in the middle of the line who will be stranded. Precisely, Edward. Emily said as she joined the station master. Where is Mr Spencer? He was up at Croven's Gate, meeting with the thin controller. He's on his way back now. Emily frowned. It would take Spencer a few hours to drive back down and they needed to do something before then. She pulled out her phone. While her thumbs tapped out a text to Spencer, she looked over at Edward. Edward, how did they handle train separation back when you were first built? There must have been something for automatic signals, surely. Edward thought for a moment, realising why Emily had asked. I think there was the token system, but that needed a bit of special equipment. I've also heard about the time interval system from Neil and Lily, but that relied on trains maintaining a constant speed. As I recall, it was considered too dangerous falling a disaster at Armour. Edward, what about the blackout approach? Edward grinned. Yes, that would do the job. Emily peered at James, puzzled. The blackout approach? It was what we had to do during the Second World War, Matt. Blackout regulations meant that the signals couldn't be lit at night. To allow night running, signalmen were posted at each station. We stopped whenever we reached them, and then they told us when we were clear to proceed. It worked well. Emily nodded thoughtfully. All the crews had mobile phones. Yes, that could work. She looked up at the two engines. Thank you. You've both been helpful. Before either of the engines could reply, Emily's phone went off. She quickly answered it. Hello? Mr. Spencer, I figured out how to get the railway running again. I'm still your PR director until Friday. Think of this as preventing a public relations disaster. Of course, I'll take full responsibility. Okay, I'll see you when you get here. She hung up and slipped her phone back into her pocket. Well, it looks like we're going ahead. You two should get ready to leave. With that... Emily turned and headed back into the station building. Meanwhile, Duck had been talking to Eric at Kelsthorpe Road. I mean, I don't really know any of my rails now, please. Eric was saying. After all, he had been built at the Craven's Gate Works in 1984. I wouldn't worry too much, Eric. 
I'm sure Sir Topper will make the decision that's best for the railway. That reminds me, I've got to leave him a message. There's no need for that, Duck. You can tell me yourself. Duck grinned as he spotted a familiar figure standing on the platform. It's a relief to see you, sir. Sir Topham frowned. From his cottage, he'd noticed a conspicuous absence of trains running along the main line and had come down to the station to see what was going on. What's up, Duck? Duck quickly explained about Shane and Gordon's accident. When he'd finished, Sir Topham's frown had deepened. Are you sure Mr. Spencer's not having Gordon repaired? Yes, sir. Miss Hatt confronted him about it. A worried look crossed Sir Topham's face. There was a reason he'd left Norman Spencer in charge for a week. If he was to make an informed decision, Sir Topham thought, he would need to have all the facts. Duck, I want you to tell me exactly what happened. I'll do my best, sir. Duck paused to collect his thoughts, then told Sir Topham as much about the argument between Emily and Spencer as he could remember. I see, Sir Topham said thoughtfully, once the Great Western engine had finished. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Duck. You and the other engines have nothing to worry about. We don't, sir? Not at all, Eric. A moment later, the station master strode up. Duck and Eric, you'll be living in a few minutes. Do you mean the signals are working again? Not exactly. You'll have to live from from station to station, receiving clearance at each one. That's a good idea. It was Miss Hart's, sir. She's coordinating this whole thing from Nafford Station. Is she indeed? Duck thought he may have heard a hint of pride in the former controller's voice. A moment later, one guard's whistle rang out, closely followed by a second. Sir Topham couldn't help smiling as he watched the two trains depart. At Wellsworth, the station master was explaining the plan to Donald and Shane. Shane, you'll need to leave first. The main line goes from three to two tracks after Mara, and Express always has priority. He finished. Emily had instructed them to leave a one station gap between each train, for safety. Are you sure this is a good idea? Shane shot a doubtful glance at the signal, still showing red. I mean, those signals are red for a reason. Did you not hear your station was to tell you it was an emergency? Yes, but the number one rule is to never pass a signal set at danger. I've not had a signal passed at danger on my record before, and I don't intend to start now. Do I need to remind you you've got a duty to your passengers? You can't just keep them here until the signals are fixed. That could be ours. I suppose you tell me you brought your passengers home when you've broken down too. Indeed. On one occasion, Edward brought his passengers home without his side rods in a fierce storm. I agree rules and regulations are in place for a reason, but really, you should use a bit of common sense. Aye. Now, will you get moving? Or am I going to have to drag ye and your coaches all the way to Barrow? Shane glanced back at Donald's train. But what about your trucks? I can look after them, Donald. That, uh, won't be necessary. Shane glanced up at the signal once more, then tooted his horn and moved off. As he did so, Diesel's words from last night came back to him. A couple of hours later, the computer problems had been repaired and the signals returned to normal. At Barrow in Furness, Shane had just finished his run. After leaving his coaches at the platform, he headed to the Northwest Railway's sheds to be turned. Henry was already waiting there, along with a small green tank engine whose nameplate read Sheffield. Henry looked suspiciously at Shane as the diesel came to a halt. I you're going to see this sort of thing won't happen on a modern railway. Shane didn't reply for a moment. His trip up to Burrow had given him a bit of time to think about what had happened at Wellsworth and what Diesel had said the night before. Can I ask you something? Go on. One of your Diesels, down at Wellsworth, mentioned something about Edward bringing home a train without any side rods. Yeah, that was back in 1965. 
I get the impression that sort of thing is normal around here. Of course it's normal. You don't think we leave our passengers a truck stuck in the middle of the line, do you? Well, no. Henry here could tell you a dozen stories or so about events like that, couldn't you, Henry? Well, yes, I mean, there was that time Percy brought an in Clarabelle for his first flight. Uh, he had to use some of Clarabelle's floorboards for his fire, Liverpool. But he was a bird, all right. Wasn't there some story about you taking the Express half painted, Henry? You were the only engine available or some such. Well, uh, yes, I mean, the permit was an insurance was jammed. It was rather embarrassing. It's alright, Henry. I've heard what I need. Shane smiled at Henry. You're right, in a way. I saw your friends pulling together to keep things moving despite a major signal fault. I haven't seen anything quite like that before. And I must admit, it was quite impressive. Impressive? Yes. I believe an apology may be in order. I think I'm beginning to understand what your class 8 friend was saying in the shed last night. Henry chuckled. I think you've just seen why this railway is still a success of the engines. I think I have, yes. I thought you said he was rude and arrogant, Henry. He was, last night. You must understand, I never had a chance to see engines like you in full service. Just on rail fan tours, really. I'd always thought you older engines had been withdrawn because you, well, weren't that good at handling trains. Nonsense! Diesels replace steam engines for one reason and one reason only. Because you lot are cheaper. Older diesels simply weren't as powerful as you newer ones. That's all there was to it. Forget about looking at the trains properly. That didn't come into it at all. Oh. Anyway, would you mind clearing the turntable? I've got to take my next train. Sheffield looked suspiciously at Shane as the diesel backs down into the shed. So I suppose you and your brothers are going to be taking over here then? Not necessarily. What do you mean? I'm only here until Friday. My controller can't spare me later than that. Mr. Spencer mainly wants to see what will be involved in modernising the railway. He'll be asking for my observations before I go. I see. And just what are you going to be telling him? Shane paused for a moment. To be honest, I don't quite know. Over the next couple of days, Shane worked with the engines of the North West Railway. Express trains, commuter runs, slow goods and container trains. He handled them all. He asked questions about how they did things, too. Once the other engines saw that he was willing to listen, they happily told him all about their railway. But Shane wasn't the only one paying attention to the railway. Norman Spencer had been keeping a close eye on how the railway was running, and he had noticed that one part in particular wasn't running as efficiently as it should have been. Around noon on Thursday, Spencer arrived in the main yard. He parked next to where Thomas was resting on a siding, and strode over to the tank engine. Thomas, it's come to my attention that there have been several small delays with trains leaving this yard. Thomas looked over, annoyed. There's a reason for that. This is Diesel's yard. He knows the routine how to work tracks here efficiently without delay. I don't. But I'm best at is running my branch line. Spencer frowned. He found that a little hard to believe. Thomas, I'd like to speak to your crew. I have lunch in the yardmaster's office. You are familiar with lunch, aren't you? Spencer's eyes narrowed. He wasn't going to take cheek from an engine like this. He turned to head over to the Yardmaster's office, then glanced back. Thomas was still watching him. Truth be told, Spencer found it a little unsettling. He always had. Well, out with it, he said as he turned and headed back to Thomas. Out with what? You may as well say whatever you want to get off your buffer while there's no one around for you to embarrass me in front of. Thomas frowned at Spencer. I've nothing to say to you you've not heard before. You didn't seem to understand when Miss Hatt spoke to you at that book, and I doubt you'll understand now. Understand what, exactly? Why people come to this railway in the first place. Anyone who doesn't get that will only ruin it. Spencer's eyes narrowed. He'll say anything to get his way, thought the acting controller. Very well, Thomas. What, in your personal opinion, is the reason people come to the railway? I know this won't be much to you, but 
I'm the last of my class. The Billington E2 tank engine. The only one that hasn't been scrapped. The same could be said for all the engines here. Even most of the diesels, like Boko. If anyone wants to see engines like us at work, in our natural environment, then they'll have to come here. Thomas paused for a moment, waiting for Spencer to reply. But the acting controller remained silent, and Thomas continued, feeling emboldened. That's what sets this railway apart, Mr. Spencer. Engines like Shane are everywhere, and aren't attractive to rail fans. Ah, yes, those wonderful rail fans I keep hearing about. You do realize, don't you, that they don't account for the bulk of the railway's income? Goods deliveries and passengers commuting or traveling to see friends and family have much more to do with a railway success. I'm not doubt. This railway may well survive for a few years with you in charge, with your modernization plans, but the reason it stands out to people is because there's something about it they can't find anywhere else. That's what they remember it for. I mean, there was a reason the think clergyman decided to write his books about us. Silence fell for a moment. Thomas looked hopefully at Spencer, who seemed to be deep in thought. He knew he'd made a good point, and just maybe he'd been able to convince Spencer otherwise. But Spencer shook his head a moment later, and Thomas's hopes were crushed. There are other railways that match that description, Thomas. They're called heritage railways. I am not here to run a heritage railway and have no intention to. One of those, or a railway museum, would be the proper place for engines like you. Now would that really be so bad? Thomas frowned, not quite sure what to think. You're still here because you were built to do your job. Whether your precious rail fans like it or not, this is your job. For now. Spencer glanced meaningfully at the trucks on the surrounding sidings. If you can't do your job well, <laughs> that's it. With that, he strode over to his car and drove off. As he headed out of the yard, Spencer couldn't help thinking that things would be a lot easier if these trains didn't have a mind of their own. Later that evening, Sheffield was bringing the coaches for the evening express to the platform at Knapford. As he gently brought them to a halt, he noticed Emily Hatt on the platform. She had a cardboard box in her hands, and behind her, a porter was pushing a trolley with suitcases on. Evening, Mom. Oh, good evening, Sheffield. Sheffield glanced at the suitcases the porter was pushing. Are you going on holiday, Miss Hart? He'd heard about her resignation. All the engines had. Just clearing out my office, Sheffield. Tomorrow's my last day. I see. Mr. Spencer is still insisting on modernising the railway, is he? I'm afraid so. I can't seem to convince him otherwise. Maybe Shane will. Shane? That diesel you brought in? Indeed. He and I had a rather interesting conversation at Barrow on Wednesday, just after all that signal bother. Sheffield told Emily what Shane had said. By the time he'd finished, she was smiling slightly. You don't say. What's more, he's been trying to learn about our way of doing things. At least that's what I've been hearing. I see. Emily smiled. Thank you, Sheffield. You've been quite helpful. Glad to hear it, Mom. Replied the austerity engine, and he chuffed away. Around nine o'clock the next morning, Emily was at the main sheds. She'd arrived in James's cab and was saying her goodbyes to the engines. It was a pleasure to work with you too, Miss Hat. I do hope we'll be seeing you again. You can be sure of that, Peter. As she had promised Thomas, Emily would be spending the foreseeable future visiting various heritage railways to find places for the engines. Looks like we've got another visitor, James observed as a red BMW pulled up. Norman Spencer joined Emily in front of the sheds a few minutes later. He looked closely at her. What are you doing here, Miss Hat? Making my farewells. I see. Without another word, Spencer strode over to Shane. Shane, your control is expecting you back this afternoon. However, I would like to hear your views on the railway before you go. How can we best handle modernizing it, that sort of thing? Oh, come on. Do you really think that's going to be a fair assessment? Spencer turned, but it was Emily who spoke up. Up down, James. Let Shane say his piece. Thank you, Mom. Before Shane could answer Spencer's question, Alice arrived, having just completed her morning branch line flyer run. She stopped just outside the shed, and a familiar, well-dressed gentleman climbed down from her cab. Spencer frowned as the former controller joined her. Sir Topham, I wasn't expecting to see you here. I heard about the diesel you'd brought in on trial. 
Sir Topham looked over at the Class 67 diesel. You must be Shane. That's right. It's an honour to meet you, Sir Topham Hutt. Shane had heard the other engines speak highly of their former controller. Sir Topham turned to Spencer. I hope you don't mind, Norman, but I wanted to hear Shane's observations for myself. I hope I'm not too late. Not at all, Sir Topham. By some coincidence, you're just in time. Spencer looked pointedly at Emily. It's not that much of a coincidence. You have this meeting listed in your Outlook calendar after all. She'd called Sir Topham that morning to tell him about the meeting and what Sheffield had said last night. I see. Spencer turned to Shane. Well, Shane? To be honest, sir, I don't think that modernising the engine fleet here would be best for the railway. I'm sorry. That wasn't quite what Spencer had been expecting to hear. I've noticed there seems to be a certain, uh, sense of duty shared by the engines here. Frankly, sir, I think that's why this railway is still a success. Um, I see. Thank you, Shane. That will be all. Emily Green. It seems your own diesel doesn't agree with you, Norman. Spencer frowned angrily. You wouldn't have put him up to that by any chance. We most certainly did not. I haven't even met him before today. Enough. I think I've seen all I need. Sir Topham turned to Spencer, a stern look on his face. Norman, I gave you this week to see how you would handle the railway. I must say I'm not impressed. Your arrogance in assuming you were the only candidate to be the next, uh, fat controller. How did you know about that? A little western bird told me. (laughs) Your lack of a response during that signal crisis on Wednesday was also unimpressive, to say the least. If Emily hadn't stepped in, your instructions would have left our passengers stranded for hours. The Fat Controller isn't just a nickname, Norman. Having that title means you're someone who's earned the respect of the engines and staff and puts the best interests of the railway first and foremost. That's what I was trying to do. As I've been saying for years, modernization will ensure this railway survives. And as I've been telling you for years, Norman, the value of this railway cannot be measured by purely financial means. I had hoped you would have learnt that. An awkward silence fell for a moment. So are the Thompson be taking over then? The railway's financial director, Thompson had always seemed to get on well with the railway's engines and staff. No, he's planning to retire in July. My only concern with nominating you, Emily, was that you were young and relatively inexperienced. But after all that's happened this week, I have no doubt you'll make a fine, uh, fat controller. Emily smiled. Thanks, Dan. What a... you mean me? Yes, if you're interested. Emily considered it for a moment. She'd always had a keen interest in the railway, unlike her two older brothers, who'd gone into IT and politics. It would be an honour. Spencer looked from Emily to Sir Topham and back again. Very well. You'll have my resignation on Monday. Now, Norman, there's no need for you to go that far. Spencer glanced over at the entrance. It seems I don't understand this railway as well as I thought. There's no place for me here, Stephen. Without another word, he strode over to his car and departed. Good riddance. All the engines had been listening closely to the conversation. Now, now, James. Congratulations, Miss Hat. Or should I call you the fat controller? It's not official yet, James. We'll have to see how things go at the board meeting. Come on, Emily. We've got a bit to discuss. With that, the two hats departed. Sir Topham's got his head screwed on right. The directors know that. I'll be surprised if Miss Hat isn't our controller by the end of the day. James glanced apologetically at Shane. Shane, I... um... thank you. I wasn't expecting you to stick up for us like that. It was just the truth as I saw it, James. Anyway, I must be up. One control is expecting me back. Shane departed a moment later, leaving two relieved steam engines behind him. We'd better let the others know about this. Indeed. I think it'll put a lot of mind to ease. A few moments later, James eagerly departed to take his next train. 
He couldn't wait to tell the others the good news. Later that afternoon, James was waiting at Napford with the Express. He, Alice, Henry and Bear were looking after it between them, in Gordon's absence. Glad to have your coaches back, Thomas. You can say that again. The tank engine had been ordered back to the Farquhar branch, around lunchtime, and Diesel had returned to the main yard. So, do you know what time that board meeting is due to finish? James shot a quick glance at the station clock. I think it started at about ten o'clock. A moment later, James caught sight of Emily, stepping out of the station building. Excuse me, Miss Hat. Yes, James? Ma'am, I was just wondering about the board meeting. Oh, James, I apologise. I've had a lot to catch up on since then, but to answer your earlier question, yes. James paused for a moment, trying to remember what he'd asked earlier. A second later, he grinned broadly. Oh, in that case, congratulations, Miss Fat Controller. Thomas looked over. Fat Controller? He asked. It sounded almost too good to be true. That's right, Thomas. The board of directors unanimously accepted that recommendation. Thomas whistled cheerfully. Well, first my boiler. That's the best news I've heard all week. Do the others know? I'll be visiting all the engines tonight to tell them, said the new fat controller. A moment later, Thomas's guard blew his whistle. As he departed, the blue tank engine couldn't help grinning. It was a relief to know that the railway was once again in safe hands. <laughs>